Hello everyone and welcome to today's event, Community Led Housing, a pathway for more caring and just urban futures. I hope you're feeling relaxed and ready for a really exciting conversation today. We have a fantastic uh, panel lined up and I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion. So thank you to you, our audience, for joining us in this uh, space today. My name is Juliet. I'm the events officer at IIED and I'll just be providing some technical support behind the screens um, for this session. So today's event is part of the IIED debate series and we're both uh, very fortunate and delighted to be co-hosting with Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil and the Citizenship School of Police Institute. We've also been able to host today's event with the support of uh, several partner organizations and we'll be um, able to hear from some of them about the fantastic work they do uh, later in the event. And with that, I am absolutely delighted to introduce Bianca Pail, who is the journalist from who is a journalist from Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil and our moderator for today's session. Bianca, over to you. Thank you, Juliet. So I want to welcome to all. As Juliet said, I'm Bianca Peel. I'm a web editor from Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil, and I'm going to and I am responsible for the podcast Guillotine. It is a pleasure to be here with you in such a relevant subject matter as housing. As Juliet already said, it's being promoted by the IIED, uh, Institute Police and School of Citizenship and Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil. And this event was inspired in an article that was published in the special Cities of, of Tomorrow of Le Monde Diplomatics with different experiences of community-led experiences in Thailand, Thailand, Brazil and Sierra Leone. So here we've got, in order to talk about those initiatives and how to strengthen, Alexandre Absan Rediani, that's the principal researcher of of the IAD, Rodrigo and Covini, Iacovini, that's a coordinator of the School of Citizenship of the Policy Institute and International Relations Office of the Global Platform for the Right to the City. He's got a PhD in regional and urban planning by the University of Sao Paulo with a bachelor degree in the law of the Federal University of Sierra. He is a former coordinator of the Brazilian Institute of Urban Law and legal advisor of the UN Special Reporter on the Right to Adequate Housing. Let us give them, welcome them. And be, we have also here Joseph McCarthy. He is a lecturer Institute of Geography and Development Studies at the University of Nanhala in Sierra Leone. He is also executive director of the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center. Joseph is a well-established scholar in the urban development with background in urban management and climate ch uh, change adaptation and resistance to disasters risk. He has worked in various different capacities on urban development and planning in Sierra Leone, including uh, projects in the in the free structure plan. Joseph research uh, centers mainly on urban land, housing, vulnerability, resilience, mobility, public health, and informal settlements. That's all the issues he's going to talk about. Here we've got also uh, Supreya Wung Pacharapun. Uh, she is an uh, assistant professor in the Faculty of Architecture in the University in Kasset Kas Start in Bangkok, Thailand. She's been involved in the research project to uh, study and investigate the practice of community development network in, Bang Bang in Bangkok. In, in her design interests are socially relevant architecture, participatory design, urban and community development. And uh, is part of this panel this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, Evanisa Lopez Rodriguez. She is a member of the House and Social Movements in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
She's been working for more than 30 years in the social protection and is an activist of the social movements in Brazil. She's got a master in urbanism. And to finish uh, our list of guests, we've got Bea Varnay. She is project manager of Urbamondi. She is passionate in, about facilitating peer learning, urban development and organizational processes underlying the community-led housing initiatives. In her capacity as project manager, she supports people-led housing initiatives across Europe, Africa and Latin America. Part of her work focuses on the design of financial mechanisms that are sustainable and self-managed uh, with the aim to enable access to affordable finance for community-led houses initiatives. Bea holds a master degree in international development from the Graduate Institute in Geneva and has worked in France, Switzerland, Germany, Brazil, Mexico and Senegal. She is an active member of the participatory, participatory uh, platform of Foundation and also Center for Community Land Trust Innovation. So prior to get started the debate, I would like to ask you that please send them questions, comments, and if you want to are part of any initiative that's part of the issues that we are talking here, please send us through the chat whatever links or contributions plus uh, questions to the panelists. So in order to start our conversation, we'll invite Alexandre that's going to talk us about the main arguments of the article that has been published in the series Cities of Tomorrow. So, Joe, Alexandre, please thank you for your introduction. You've got five minutes. Great. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you very much. It's incredible to, to be here in this panel and to be discussing this topic with all of you. So this article is written together with Thaisa Comelli and Taka Landsman, who are also here coordinating this event and helping us, uh, uh, especially around the questions and answers and putting all of these things together. And it was also a result of an ongoing dialogue between uh, these uh, colleagues and organizations that are present today in this event, as well as others that uh, represent other organizations that I think Juliet shared the list of partners that was part of those uh, dialogues, which includes, for example, the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, uh, which is a regional network of grassroots community organizations, NGOs and professionals in the Asian cities, and the Center for Dialogue on Human Settlement and Poverty Alleviation, an NGO based in Freetown that was also part of, of those conversations. Through these conversations and, and, and the article, we, we found that it's really important uh, to join forces with other organizations, such as World Habitat and Abamond, and social movements that, that have been already for a while promoting this concept of community-led housing, which refers to non-speculative and collective processes of producing housing, which is centered around people's needs and aspirations rather than monetary exchange. Community-led housing then we often use as an umbrella term that refers to a variety of different housing practices. And those include, for example, people-centered upgrading, cooperative and collaborative housing, self-build, self-management, communal forms of land management, such as community land trusts, as well as other forms of collective action around housing rights. So occupations, demonstrations, savings, enumerations, and so forth. We think it's important to promote this concept, uh, and we think really the, the, the purpose of, of having those conversations, writing the article, to support those other networks, because uh, it's a way of standing with social movements and amplifying the message that solutions to the global housing crisis must include those who are excluded from or made vulnerable by current housing systems. In a more pragmatic way, we also think that community-led housing offers a tangible alternative to dominant housing policy and practice, which focuses purely on market-based mechanisms and individual home ownership as its main goal and purpose. We think that this dominant housing approach have reduced housing choices. It led various forms of housing discriminations while deepening social and spatial inequalities in cities. Furthermore, this financialization of housing has underpinned the pro 
um, has undermined the protection and the promotion of the right to adequate housing, uh, UN commitments uh, among different nation states, and expanded the housing precarity among middle-income households. In the meantime, community-led responses to this housing crisis have helped to build a series of capabilities of communities to respond not only to the housing crisis, but also to other crises, such as the COVID pandemic. So we have, and that's an argument that we try to flesh out in, in the article, in which also re, um, is drawing on a, a publication that Urban Mond has made, also talking about similar, similar issues. And I think uh, Bear might touch on some of those issues a bit later on. So we have seen that social ties and solidarity and care built through struggles for the right to housing have been fundamental to the spread of solidarity actions to help those most vulnerable at the time of the pandemic. We have also seen that the communication infrastructure and the pedagogical experience of housing movements have been quickly and effectively deployed to spread critical information about COVID that talks to the actual needs of those most vulnerable to the pandemic. At the same time, these infrastructures and pedagogies has, have been fundamental in facilitating public debates and raising our, our awareness about the injustices being perpetuated in COVID responses and the inequalities that the pandemic exposed. And finally, we also have seen how the ability to navigate between the need to act and meet immediate housing needs while also demanding from the state policy and structural change has helped move movements to do in this COVID crisis what the state should have been doing, but they were not doing, but at the same time, not letting them off the hook. Therefore, demanding specific policy and structural responses for the issues that have been experienced on the ground. So for us, this article and our dialogues have brought to the forefront the need to advocate for more enabling conditions to advance community-led housing. We feel that there has been a lot of already existing documentation of community-led practices uh, for housing, but at the same time, we feel we need to touch on the conditions, on the things that enable or have or constrain the possibility to advance community-led housing. So what has emerged as, uh, as, a, as an initial set of issues uh, for a shared agenda is that for housing policies and programs to support community-led housing, there is an ur urgent need to first establish legal frameworks that recognize the diverse models of community-led housing, two, to create organizational and financial arrangements that responds and builds capacities of community-based organizations. Three, we need to unlock access to well-located land or properties for community-led housing. And four, there is a key need to mainstream participatory methodologies of planning, designing, implementing, management, and managing and learning from community-led housing initiatives. So this is, is an initial set of issues that are emerging as, as, as an agenda, which we hope to advance and to also to hear uh, more reflections about them through this conversation today and from the people joining our conversation. So we hope that this IID debate will be an opportunity to share experiences in this field and to discuss these issues in, in, in more details. And I'm really looking forward for the contributions of the other panelists and the questions from those participating in the event. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Alexandre. Yeah, now I'm going to give the word to Rodrigo that coordinates the serious series of tomorrow. He, that he has collaborated with Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil, and he is going to talk about the importance of community-led housing for the discussions on the housing crisis, mainly in this area of COVID-19. So thank you, Bianca. I am so happy in order to be able to talk in Portuguese in an event with a translation into English. It's not always that this happens, so, and so I'm very happy that be able to talk in Portuguese to you and very happy as way well that this do this event in partnership between IID, the School of Citizens of uh, Police, Le Monde Diplomatique, and the participation 
all the many different brothers and sisters or the housing discussion that are present here today. So it's going to be a very interesting thing for us to advance in the collective discussion of the issue of housing. And I think that this event shows what we actually wanted to achieve with the special cities of tomorrow within Le Monde Diplomatique and also what we have developed in the School of Citizenship of the Policy Institute in many different documents, international documents and many different players that dialogue with us uh, and that work in around urban subject matters actually place to the cities many different features and characteristics of, of ways or forms that the city should be or develop. What do I mean by this? There are people that uh, state that the cities should be resilient in order to be able to survive and face the conflicts and social environmental disasters. There are people that, or other players that say that cities should be competitive, attractive in order to attract businesses and people and investments. And there are other players that say that the cities need to be intelligent. So that smart city is one of the most trendy issues for us. But for us in the Policy Institute and in the Global Platform for the, uh, the Right to the City School of uh, Cities, uh, the cities need to be solidary, uh, have solidarity, not only to be have solidarity with or uh, inhabited with those that are uh, living in cities, but also have solidarity among themselves in order to build a new society, a new world, a new reality, urban reality, we need to co be cooperative among these different cities, competition, dispute, this loss gain game has shown that it's a failure. That has been the game for the last couple of years or decades, and it's obvious that that model doesn't function. So our proposal is a different model. It's cooperation and solidarity, and that comes from the practice. So spaces as cities of tomorrow, spaces of school of citizens, space, citizens are these initiatives that IID is bringing, not only this IID debate, but all these spaces on thinking, uh, housing, community-led housing, these processes are very important for the change because when we place into discussion different experiences and realities uh, different points of view of what the city should be because of course each city ha has a right to have a different uh, has a right to have a different vision when you place all those different ways of of thinking being and building the city onto the table to discussion then yes we can achieve cities that are more fair that are more democratic in the distribution of the benefits of the urban space that are environmentally balanced and healthy that are socially responsible so the special cities of tomorrow within the Le Monde Diplomatique Brazil that I'm very happy of coordinating. I would like to thank the trust of Bianca and all the team of the editorial of Le Monde in order to host this special. It's a space that wants to bring to the Brazilian, for the Brazilian public experiences and realities and reflections on cities out of Brazil. Although we might bring discussions uh, for the Brazilian cities, it should be a space that we could learn more on realities of African cities, other country, other cities from Latin America, from Asia, Europe, and North America. So in that sense, 
the Space Cities of, of Tomorrow, it's open to receive contributions from the many different cities with different subjects for discussion because it's that diversity and collaborations that we are going to promote. And now the same, the, the Citizen School of Policy Institute, when Bianca discussed about the importance of dialoguing or with uh, communities based on way in order to face the housing crisis, the School of Citizenship has a very important space because we believe that collectively we can build a different future and this is why we have done created discussion spaces on, on housing, ways of actually overcoming this present model based in individual mm, housing based on market and we have worked people that have given classes Gracia Xavier for example if contact with people has Guilherme Bolos from MST Rale Lunique that because we believe that building bridges between movements, academy, organizations, civil society, public authorities and other players, then we are going to exit this model that is actually an uh, excluding model. And so that's a lot of this, this mod of this discussion. So a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you very much for, uh, for this series of being making the coordination. It has been very important for us actually to have the, your content in our website. So, prior to give you the word to Joseph, I want to thank the amount we've got 140 people in the discussion by Zoom but the audience of YouTube, I, we've got participants from Ireland, India, Kenya, San Carlos in Brazil, here in Sao Paulo, the people from House and from Sao Paulo. Thank you very much to all of you. Feel at ease to include your common questions and talk about the initiatives that you've been participating. So, continuing with our discussion, I'm going to invite Joseph to tell us about his experience, initiatives, community in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, and talk about the importance of those initiatives for the for more fair cities, as we've mentioned here. Joseph, you've got five minutes to talk to us. Thank much, Bianca, and hello to everyone. I think I will just have to follow uh, from where uh, Rodrigo stopped. Of course, um, there has been a lot of uh, ideals floated on planning for cities to become, inclusive, fair, socially just as the case may be. But essentially, when you really look at context like Freetown, Sierra Leone, or elsewhere, especially in the global south, or more especially in sub-Saharan Africa, or possibly Latin America, you will see that some of these ideals are a lot difficult to, 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 to meet. I'm talking about context where we are faced with uh, challenges of rapid urbanization, where there is high levels of poverty, um, housing deficit, we are struggling with uh, slum proliferation, where essentially policies, especially land, uh, related to land, housing, for the low income groups is not working, where urban poor families are missed out on investment in housing. So essentially, community led housing has come to be seen as a direct response to some of these realities. And so in Freetown, Sierra Leone, a lot has been done, especially in terms of uh, promoting community-led housing, but more especially in terms of uh, promoting a particular principle that was uh, uh, jointly implemented in Freetown with uh, Architecture of Some Frontier uh, UK, ASF UK. And this has been about working to promote what we describe as community area action plan. Of course, planning in Sierra Leone is at different scales and the lowest form of uh, planning is the local, uh, uh, the, the, the um, um, neighborhood planning, but more especially, so especially in terms of local uh, uh, plans. 
And so it has been very difficult for the city authorities, the government as well, to really promote this in terms of providing housing for the urban poor. And because of this, we had to engage with uh, the, the, uh, the ASF uh, UK to really work how to promote a kind of principles that can work towards presenting a kind of methodology to follow in terms of really uh, ensuring that uh, we create a model where housing can be provided for the urban poor. And this has been action-led methodology that uses a kind of participatory design and planning uh, approach consisting of a series of workshop with the community uh, residents, but also uh, based on seminars. And the idea was really to attempt to have an understanding of the social, 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 spatial, and urban dynamics of these communities. It was about ensuring that we provide support to the residents, but also ensure that they are able to understand their own situation and therefore play advocacy around it so that we can have a kind of more democratic form of city building. And so this particular methodology took place at different scales, uh, which involved engagement at the home scale. It also uh, involved an engagement at the community scale, but also at the city scale. And the, the idea there was to really have the residents to have a reflection in terms of what really are the key issues that matter to them? What are the aspirations in terms of housing? How can they go about to be supported to bring about the kind of change that we want? And to also determine what kind of future do they want for themselves? So community-led housing uh, using this CAP approach has been very instrumental, especially in terms of promoting change within these communities, especially because it has been about how do we make housing accessible to low income group? It is, has been so much about how do we, lock, uh, how do we unlock uh, creativity among the uh, low income groups, but also help them to build a kind of vision for themselves. It is so much about how do we work with poor families to provide housing that meets the needs of uh, their uh, households, especially in terms of disability, but also in terms of quality. And it has been a matter of helping the poor households to really fulfill their dreams and aspirations about housing. So it is so much a matter of how do we restore the dignity of the families? How do we make them have a sense of identity? How do we make them have that sense of pride? How do we make them have a sense of fulfilled dream? So community-led housing, especially using the CAP approach, has been so much about helping the low income groups to be able to really identify the kind of houses that they consider to be very convenient for themselves, the kind of houses they will cherish for themselves, and how do we also link that up with the city authorities to be able to ensure that these dreams are fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much for respecting the time as well. So now I'm going to give the word so Supreya to tell us a little bit about the initiatives in Thailand that she's been working with. So Supriya, you've got five minutes to give yours. Hello everyone from the other side of the world and thank you Bianca and our organizer for inviting me to share experience of the community-based practice in Thailand here with you today. Uh, Community-led housing in Thailand has been widely conducted through the Bad Man Kong program or uh, Secure Housing, um, initiated by CODI, uh, stand for Community Organizations Development Institute. It's a public organization and this program has been widely practiced since 2000. CODI has supported more than uh, 100,000 households in uh, three, 370 cities nationwide and its process had been emphasized on people as the subject of change in every stage. Um, for 20 years of practice, it has been proved that this program has empowered the grassroots movement at many levels. And let me share with you some image so that you can understand it clearly. Okay, so 
at the individual level and community level, there have been transformation of housing and public infrastructure that improve the life of the people as well as the neighborhood. And the community com member can decide together whether they want to implement the small upgrading of infrastructure project or the whole community reconstruction or the relocation uh, if nece necessary. And housing construction by the community also enable uh, the group of community builders to start the community enterprise and create jobs to the youth group. Uh, further, seven groups found in each community have provided them an opportunity to accumulate wealth individually and create a collective community welfare fund that can be used to support its member, uh, especially elders and children. And beyond housing, these self-organized community organizations in each city are networked through the program of CODI. It has been demonstrated that this um, the mutual care and solidarity among them have been strengthened. We have seen the power of this network in supporting each other to demand for the right to the city, resist uh, eviction of the informal settlements, and especially during the crisis, not only uh, the recent COVID-19, but also in previous natural disasters such as flood. Uh, these active community networks start their own immediate assistance to reach the member by using their own collective funds without waiting for the support from the government. There have been uh, various activities initiated by the network in many cities around the nation in response to the COVID-19. Uh, not only immediate help as providing alcohol gel or masks, but they also start a community garden and communal kitchen project to ensure their full security during the lockdown. Uh, these support are not limited to only their networks member, but also extend to the other vulnerable groups or homeless people in the city. Food and product they have uh, produced became a part of their business plan to earn income during the crisis. And many communities have run their own organized market or online de delivery initiatives, while some have connected with other stakeholders to sell the products. Uh, the network have also initiated their own long-term rehabilitation plans with initial fund from another CODI program called uh, Quality of Life Initiative. And I think uh, at the city level, what is very important for the community-led housing movement in Thailand is that it has shifted the power and the way how the city operates from a very uh, silo governmental structure and very highly centralized bureaucratic system to a horizontal and integrated platform for city development. Uh, the conventional system in which hierarchy of power exists while the informal community are unorganized has been a cause of unequal distribution of resources and uneven development. Uh, the city development platform formulated through the Bai Man Kong Community-led housing program has transformed the convenient con convention uh, practice and include all the relevant stakeholders, especially landowners, municipality, public authority, and civil society to recognize each other and and especially uh, the community network, and they work together toward a fairy, fairer city in the future. Um, in this aspect, it could be said that the role of CODI as a government institute and the community organization network are very important, uh, as well as their relationship with local governments. And I think that's all for the Thai community-led housing practice I would like to share with you for this first round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supreya, for being within the times. I want to highlight the invitations that you that are here with you to thank the, all the audience. We've got more than 140 people following the discussion. We understand that you can put the city and country where you are coming from and send some initiatives and comments for programs of housing that you are part of and put Questions and questions and comments to our panelists. Now I'm going to invite then Ivanisa to tell us a little bit about the importance of the communities initiatives in Brazil. Ivanisa, please, you've got five minutes. 
Thank you, Bianca. It's fantastic to be here with you. There's so many people. It's important to have these spaces in order to share our experiences and think together how to build the future. I want to share with you one of the our experiences in Sao Paulo we've been working with in these last 30 years. So it's self-management uh, housing. I'm going to share also some photographs for in order to illustrate our conversation. But the idea is that in these processes, the community is actually the protagonist of that so housing solution. It's the main actor. It's the first Prior to anything else, it organized, creates a community that will fight for the land uh, property through an occupation and pressure to the public authority, uh, financing, uh, funding. And then all the phases of productions are controlled by the community with the support of a technical support. We are talking about uh, the elaboration of the project, permits, approvals. That's very bureaucratic. I suppose that in your country is the same thing. The management of construction, acquisition of material, quality control, and mainly the management of the resources are in the hands of the community in order that they can do the best as possible that renders uh, accounts to the government and to the group. And, and it's very clear that in those processes, the quality of the production is far better than when you bring a conventional private initiative housing building we are much more efficient way of expenditure of the public funding with a much bigger quality of what is standard in the market and there's more than that then then the sense of ownership of that person that's going to leave that because who has chosen decided given an opinion participated in the process is he or she who will live there he's the subject of that action so his own house the other important is community so uh, what we call in brazil motirao that is an indigenous word that is m collective work and that is what one of the important values of creating, of creating community. We not only build houses, but citizenships. It's not uh, neighborhoods, but communities that, that we are building. The first uh, building is strengthening the grassroots organization. They're going to build that. The community. But after building the house, that place will be organized in order to face other challenges for example, go out, then they will go after education, health, in order to prove their life quality also, and, and a, a way of leveraging the collective capacity of that place. So if there's a company that comes here, builds and goes away, there's nothing left but for the houses. But if that community is involved in the building, that community empowers itself, and we are going to have more capacity uh, and even to face and do the management and discuss with the public authority for more improvements and bring the values of solidarity corporations that we love. So in order to make this feasible, it's essential to build public policies that actually contemplate that way of production. Subsidies, subs, uh, subsidies from the side to help these families that are the ones need them all, that are excluded from the market, that don't have access to housing or financing for banking system, are not part of the ma formal market. If with these families that we want to build public policies inclusive, that will actually serve those that need the most. And for that, the movement makes a advocacy with the public authorities. So we go and struggle for resources, for land, finances, programs, in order to produce quality housing inserted in the cities, in the best places of the cities, in the neighborhoods, in order to fight these uh, real estate speculations so that the property actually come, accomplishes the social objective of uh, property. We do workshops and 
we also do pressure in the, in the streets with the campings in public spaces. In the next block, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools that we use for that. But I understand that the main concept that I wanted to defend in this discussion is that the communities that from building collectively, they turn themselves an active uh, str uh, strength in the city, creating a social network strengthening this city. Thank you. Ivaniza, thank you very much. Uh, uh, within the time, very important. The issues that you discussed now in order to finish our first part of the event, I'm going to invite Via to talk us about about urban mode and the importance of systematizing these different initiatives of community-led housing. Bea, you've got five minutes. Thanks so much um, for inviting me and it's always a, a big honor to speak alongside such inspiring leaders that have been yeah, working so hard for so many years on, on promoting community-led housing across the world. So. Um, yeah, I would say maybe just to introduce that oftentimes I guess we have the impression that, you know, community-led housing is sort of um, nice, uh, isolated experiences um, scattered around the world, but um, oftentimes we see them a bit as like best practices that cannot put to scale. And I think what is interesting, we just heard from Thailand, we also heard from Brazil, different experiences of like putting really these community-led housing experiences at scale. Um, and it is, is actually possible if we have adequate and enabling policy frameworks, if we have support at different levels. And also if we change mindsets, I thought it was very interesting that some of the speakers talked about, um, you know, participatory planning practices, training, and those issues that are also linked to, to changing the mindset and building kind of an enabling um, environment for community housing to spread. And this is something that um, we try to promote, you know, through the Cohabitat Network. Um, so yes, generating um, data and information on community housing is really key to, you know, create a shared vision around it, to, to enable peer learning and policy transfer at different levels, um, to strengthen the movement generally. And also to make those demands heard, you know, we heard about um, demands for the access to land, the demands for the access to facilitated um, housing finance, affordable housing finance, um, the access to technical assistance. Um, and um, yes, maybe another idea I would like to share with you is just that uh, we've painfully learned that, you know, viruses um, travel, but also what is important is that, you know, ideas travel. And one of the experiences or interesting experiences of disseminating um, community at housing, uh, and specifically in this case, um, mutual aid housing cooperatives, um, they have traveled uh, across, uh, you know, not, not only Latin America, but the world more generally. And this is why it's so important also to document these experiences and the, the policy frameworks that enable them. So I will by no means go into the detail of this <laughs> in this presentation, but just to show you, you know, that's something that was born in Uruguay, um, is spreading uh, across the continent and also inspiring experiences um, in different regions of the world. Um, and um, a last thought I would like to share in this initial round with you is um, linking, of course, to the, the COVID-19 context and crisis and the idea that, you know, it is also important to, to create this shared knowledge uh, and uh, data basically on the, the potential of community-led housing in different um, in different areas. You know, we've heard um, we've heard from Thailand about um, communities organizing in the COVID-19 context to really resist um, this crisis, to get organized, to create alternatives. Um, there's also many many stories that we collected through the specific study we did with the support of We Effect um, on community-led housing in the context of. COVID-19 on, you know, even psychosocial support, also solidarity networks that are created within, within community housing. So these are just one, some of the examples that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, and uh, to say that, uh, you know, to say that I think it, this is also one, another very invaluable initiative of like kind of creating that shared knowledge basis that allows um, 
these different organizations of different countries and regions to to advocate you know for more policy support for for more support generally to to their initiatives and it's it's interesting that we come together and and yeah do that together this knowledge sharing and documentation thank you muito obrigada bea thank you bea so now we're going to the second uh, round of our discussion. We're going to see the questions and answers sent by you. So please, I invite you all to send questions, comments, or tell us about some initiatives that you are part of. So the first question that we've got here was sent by Melissa Keturo Navarra to Supriya. She's asking, it seems that the success of uh, lead housing uh, community uh, lead housing depends on the community. How the government has supported the houses that are not that organized, uh, taking them so that they could have community lead housing. So, Supriya, so what's a challenge for the communities that are not that well organized? Yeah, actually, um, actually, through the Baman Kong program, uh, it is allow the people to network each other, especially the informal settlement dwellers. They meet each other and they conduct like a survey, and then uh, you know it build like a recognition among the people themselves, and they start many activity together in order to mobilize the community organizations, such as like seven groups or a community survey, community mapping, or community design as a part of um, uh, building a stronger community organization. It's not like uh, they are very well organized at the beginning. It took like more than 10 years for some community to, to get uh, strengthened and be uh, very uh, self-organized. There's another question for Joseph. Do could you talk a little bit more about the importance of the participation of the communities that issued of the participative uh, processes? You mentioned it many times. I could like Joseph to mention the importance of that participation in the building of the neighborhood planning in Freetown in Sierra Leone. You have already commented a little that process. I would like you to depthen a little bit more regarding the participation of the communities in the plan building. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I uh, I have to show uh, this. Uh, this uh, slide now to Paul more or less demonstrates what I actually meant. Basically, the community action area plan had to go through a process, but the process was actually more interactive and more participatory. And this was so in order to really give uh, the community residents an opportunity to really express themselves to be part of the entire process and to really showcase what exactly it is that they want. So I said uh, initially that the CAP methodology went through scales. There was the home scale, which the photo indicates, especially in terms of people at their level as households or as families engaging with the researchers to indicate, especially what is it that they think about their community? What kind of actions do they want to see, especially in terms of change? How to engage with that particular change process? And how can that possibly connect with the wider community? And there was also the engagement at the community level that brought different families and households together to relate with similar questions and then bring in the broader community to see how their community can broadly engage with the city. How can you make the community a better place to make it relevant to the city and to also ensure that the city works best for the people living in that particular uh, uh, community? And how can these actions and these decisions more or less influence 
policy and planning to make that particular area a better place. And each of these at the home community city and uh, policy level went through stages of diagnosing the problem, but also thinking about the best ways of dealing with it and what particular strategic actions will be necessary to be able to do it. And how do we prioritize those particular actions? So here you realize that we already have the home scale where a lot of actions went into uh, uh, the process itself, especially in terms of establishing exactly what is it that matters to the people, the kinds of physical space, the kind of layout, the kinds of materials that they think are very, very important, the kind of tenure arrangements that they think matters so much. And when you go to the community scale, it allowed the residents to also share their understanding of the current conditions of the shared spaces in terms of the physical infrastructure and who accesses them, but also to share the ideas for inclusive community spaces that reflect the community's collective values and aspirations. And discussions were also held about the challenges and opportunities to change within the community. At the city scale, which now brought the entire community together with different other actors elsewhere, it was also an opportunity for residents to share their understanding as well as their experiences of the current citywide processes and conditions, and to share the ideas for citywide actions to make Freetown work more for them, to make Freetown more inclusive, to make Freetown more fairer, and to make Freetown socially just. So what are the aspirations of the people within these informal settlements that needs to matter to the city authorities and how can they take them forward? So there are discussions also on the challenges as well as the opportunities for bringing about more equitable and socially just, uh, 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 to make Freetown more, more socially just and more fairer for the people. And so all of these collectives, the ideas at the different scales, the home, the, 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 the community, the city, we are all consolidated. And this brought about an, a kind of integrated thinking on the options to take. If the city, if the community has to be improved, the kinds of housings to choose, the kind of organization to, to bring about in terms of the spatial development of the place, the kinds of uh, uh, infrastructure that has to be built, the kinds of services that has to be produced, provided. What are the particular principles to follow? What particular options that we can also agree on for programming as well as for uh, interventions in these particular place, places for by city authorities. So all these agreements were part of the CAP process. And the CAP process actually allowed the very people who will be affected by the problem to be actively involved in the planning, but more so, in, it also highlights the creativity of the local residents themselves in bringing about solutions to the problems in their communities. So these are the kinds of actions that we are taking. And as you can see, we have three different layouts that actually portray some of these uh, collective thinking, which the communities were a critical part of. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Very interesting. The, see how much the participation of the people that actually live in the place actually makes a difference in all uh, affecting the quality of the place. So I would like to think a comment that we received from Paula Sevilla Nunez. She was uh, the discussion. It's been wonderful and the examples inspiring. I wanted to elaborate more how to manage the opposition of powerful groups in the cities that could make lobby against the leads that support community-led housing. We are talking about a political aspect that could eventually uh, harm or attack the interest of the community in pro of private interest. I don't know whether one of you would like to answer that it was not addressed to anybody special. Ivanisa, please. Palacio, yes. yes, absolutely. So here in San Paulo, we've got, we are living that very specific moment with the, 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 the real estate sector. Even during the pandemic, it's actually increasing their profits. A lot of launches of buildings at very high prices and want, they want even more and actually destroy the little amount of tools that we've got for access for land. 
so it's a we've got an ongoing tension between the market or the real estate the investors of housing that they are that their companies their uh, real estate fans or the international market that puts pressure so that more pieces of the city are given free of charge to them for their uh, uh, investment expelling the pure, poorer people to f even far from the city so we are struggling in order to find resources but also we are make a struggle in order to have urban policies that assure these people to still continue living in the city in the best places of the city where there is infrastructure employment opportunity and this is a very important uh, struggle as a housing because it goes hand by hand those two struggles if you want a more mixed city with space for all thank you yes so we've got one more question that i think that is related to what supreya told us that is from jaganata venka tamaria Sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. That's the challenge of doing such an international participant. But he questions Supreya whether well, you've made any validation of checking with ecological engineering in order to water management, energy and waste. And he gives some examples, biogas in order to handle kitchen waste. If there is any model to work in that sense, and he asks also if there is any article that you could share a link. During the construction process uh, of uh, new housing, the committee learned that the previous uh, condition of informal settlement quite uh, bad in terms of sanitation and waste management. So they cooperate with the engineer from Cody and also uh, other architects from uh, educational institute to, to install a proper uh, sanitary system and, and waste management within the construction process. So I think right now, like uh, the new project have been, um, has been uh, quite uh, well prepared uh, with, with that system. So we've got more questions. There's a participant, someone from the Philippines says that, that she sees that women are the more active in the organizations regarding these issues of housing and fund access. What are the roles of men in that situation? I think that is an issue open for any of you to answer. Maybe B also wants to say a couple of works. Maybe you've done some systematization. Could you talk a little bit also about the gender in the struggle for housing? That question, it's interesting. I think, I mean, I think a basic principle of, of community-led housing is just to build on what is existent and the way people actually work in their communities. I mean, the way society functions and the way their communities are organized. So, you know, one of the basic principles in, in Asia, but also in in Africa around community-led housing um, are often based on savings groups, for instance, and that's um, in some countries, but not in all, a very female activity. So something that um, women would come together and um, save together. That's, a, that's an activity that women would engage with more in some countries. So community-led housing just draws on, on what is existent and reinforces, strengthens it, and puts it maybe to scale whenever that is relevant and possible. Um, and I guess um, one of the reasons as well why, why women are more present in these examples many times is, of course, because they are the ones who are usually most concerned about anything that is linked to, you know, the household care activities within the household. Um, and um, yeah, also they are most uh, vulnerable potentially to, to anything that affects um, their homes and their very local communities. 
I see Supriya raised her hand, so I can maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree with you that women quite uh, very uh, active participant in the process, but men also uh, contribute to uh, the construction part, like in 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 Thailand, as I mentioned earlier, that they form like a, a construction worker and also train the youth group within the community to 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 do the job. So I think they also take. A big role in that, and and it's quite very important to monitor the process of construction of the houses by uh, themselves. Yeah, and it's quite safe the cost of the construction when the people participate in the construction process in every stages, like order the material, uh, monitor the con uh, the labor, or even uh, construct uh, the house by themselves. Benedito, Benedito Barbosa from the Union of Movements of Housing in Sao Paulo. I think that something that's essential in Brazil is a criminalization of the struggles of the leaders that push forward the advocacy. And he says, he asks, how do you face a process of criminalization if that happens in other countries? Mimi, if Anissa could actually start to comment, and if any of you that in other countries won't have exp experience of criminalization of social movements in the struggle for housing, please. So, what we comment is something that we have seen in the time that is being worsening in the current government of Brazil. Yeah, extremely authoritarian that wants to qualify as terrorism. Any action of the pressure of the grassroots of the country, the, so the organization of the moment has uh, prepared in order to face that kind of situation because they actually they undermine the capacity of organization of the movement. So for us, it's something very important in this moment in Brazil. But we would like to know how other countries also face that kind of challenge. Não sei se Anybody else would like to comment anything regarding this process of criminalization in other countries? Because if not, we can pass to other questions. We are, we've got 25 minutes of country and we've got many questions from the public. And I would like to thank the participation of all of you. So I'm going to continue to another question in the, in the context of your own countries, in which ways uh, approaches leaded by community contribute for the sustainability and accessibility in the housing solutions. That question has already more or less uh, touched upon, but that issue of sustainability could, some, could be something that we could answer be uh, or Joseph would or Alexandre would like to comment a little bit on that. Na verdade, Actually, I'm going to abuse and go back to the prior issue that that uh, opens a good link that we cannot lose. That's the issue that's been said regarding criminalization of the housing movements in Brazil, and. I believe that that's linked to uh, important things as the, legi the social legitimacy of the struggles pro housing in our societies and then the social legitimacy is not only in the struggles when we think specifically in the in the political process uh, used by the movement but the social legitimacy but of the idea of living of having housing, the policies, the housing policies that many times are seen as a uh, subsidiary or a housing policy that is based only for sectors that are not able to get into the market, to assure their needs through the market. So sees the, the, the policies focus in that uh, population, but the issue is how we understand um, housing as a social issue. It's not by chance that the right of a house to housing is a social right, it's a human right. 
we've got human and cultural rights and the right to houses or social right but it can also be addressed socially and collectively and for that we need to rebuild the notion of housing as a collective issue so I say this be based on our reality in Brazil, but I think that also applies to other realities in other countries as well, where we've got not only a low income class, but this median income class that don't see themselves as subjects or beneficiaries of a policy that because they think that pain the installment of the house that she is addressing but actually the scheme of financing that something actually drowns the budget of the family is a political decision regarding housing so what i want to tell you with that is that we need to build within the society a notion that all of us regardless of in different economical situations and different situations of vulnerability, we are all together to build housing as a collective demand, the collective good. So we need to build the social history, that idea. And that's why we assure legitimacy so more and more uh, policies as the housing uh, led community housing actually uh, grow uh, so fighting e economical interests that won't maintain that politics are produced through the market in an individually matter. So we need to advance on that and being able to diminish the criminalization of the movements. Thank you. So we've got an issue regarding talking what Joseph said. He, the person that sent the question, wants to congratulate for his work and will ask how that initiative has was received by the government and the relevant ministries or departments. The projects created by the cities are going to be converted into programs, projects, and will they have funds from the government? Yeah, I think I responded to the question. But then, just for the sake of the generality, yes, um, there has been a lot of struggle initially when we uh, presented or we proposed the community action area plan, and more especially the, the guiding principles towards uh, ensuring that communities are made better. And quite recently, as recent as the last two years, we have received a lot of support because the current mayor seems a lot passionate about it. Uh, the point is the she has the intention to improve these spaces, but then how to go about it is the question is the problem because there has been no hardly any plan, especially at that level of the community or that level of the neighborhood to really uh, 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 guide the process. And so, so she has shown a lot of interest. She has. Uh, uh, been working especially with that as luck, but also with a few NGOs and she's working to pilot some of these experiences and more especially the plan in a few other communities, but also taking on board actions that can address some of the priorities that were highlighted in the community action area plan that was done for two communities. We are also helping her to do another for another community, but a, a number of NGOs have also shown a lot of interest uh, to be able to do this. The fact remains that the central government is really not too much into those kinds of discussion, especially so when they are more at the policy level. But what is certain is that the land policy has recently been revised and the community level is going giving a lot of attention. There is also the prospect to revise the uh, housing policy, which is very old. And there is also the impression that a lot of the key principles, as well as the uh, priorities that were identified, will have to be taken into consideration, especially in terms of programming and planning. Thank you. 
Muito obrigada, Joseph. Thank you very much, Joseph. So we've got some questions. I'm trying to group them. I think that Ivanisia could answer because they, are, they relate more with the legal framework. So Medium is talking here. It seems that the cooperativism could be an interesting pathway to strengthen these collective initiatives. And Mariangela also asked, how do you make effective the right to the land? In Brazil, we have seen how the grassroots plants are, are important. Sorry for the noises in my home. So, there is an issue. It was mentioned that the legal frameworks are very important, mainly when we try to implement new models in order to introduce the collective legitimacy of the land. How the project have supported the legal advice in order to overcome those obstacles and create precedents that could support community-led housing. Could you start, Evanisa, talking about this work that the movement, the housing movement has done in order to create a legal framework that's related with this op op collective opportunity? And if someone else wants to comment something else on how that support was formed, in order to exceed the current obstacles in other countries. So it's very interesting or sad sometimes say that in our society, in almost countries, the legal framework is for to transform, to transfer funds to the private sectors are always very well down. There's no questioning so the systems of bidding and so forth. The actual resource is a bad one. You talked about the public resources for the community for to answer, uh, cover their own needs and the rights that are being denied by the public authorities. There's a lot of, of objections. In, for 30 years, we've been trying to answer to the government uh, for more for for the um, different ministry, the, the judiciary. Uh, general attorneys, why we uh, require that uh, we have that demand of to all the land in order to cover a right that has not been uh, complied with. So after the, a lot of criminalization by the authority, we are called to be answerable in courts many times because although we actually comply with all the norms, we understood that it's very important to have a legal framework specific for the practice that is already exists, but is not uh, totally restored by legislation, because there is also some a breach to be for us to be questions. Uh, we are get getting our inspiration from countries from uh, Uruguay that has this law where the participation of cooperatives is foreseen. The the, in Argentina, we have already done a struggle for the occupation of a, to, to have a legal framework and some countries of Central America also we have already been able to approve uh, legal frameworks like El Salvador with uh, housing laws with the participation of the community. So it's to regulate uh, that concept and that understanding that yes, there are community ways of relating with the public funds in order to these lands are appropriated by communities. There are, there are ways of uh, ownership, collective ownership that could be implemented both in land and also the, the set of housings and thinking also in the urban sphere because also in the land there are the collective ways of appropriation of the land that are not acknowledged so so we are making an initiative that is building a, 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 a draft of law to be introduced in the national uh, congress that is foreseen in the law that we can pr present drafts for law we want to discuss with the brazilian parliament uh, to create an action that lets clear and gives more uh, uh, 
answer for those actions that the community has already done without the public authority that when the public authority decides to support, they also have uh, the support without being questioned legally because of that. That was a little bit the moment that we are building now. Thank you very much, Ivanisa. I don't know, Bea, if you want to comment about the different uh, initiatives that you have in uh, Urban Monde, if you've got something regarding legal uh, support in order to handle uh, within legislation that do not acknowledge the collective actions. Is there any case to mention? Um, yeah, I would say there's loads of them. So um, I guess one of the ways of advocating for a change in, in local or national policies is to kind of showcase, you know, what is possible in, in other countries, maybe in similar contexts. Um, and one of the ways of doing that, that, uh, you know, local communities or grassroots organizations have developed, among many other things, is also to kind of do um, peer learning, but across like, um, you know, uh, public servants or local authorities. So um, this specifically is an example um, within the SDI network in Africa. So there were a few um, experiences where uh, one federation would take their local authority to a different country to speak to local authorities in that specific country and to, you know, kind of tell them how to how to implement something different, why it is of interest to a local government um, and how it can be done. And I believe that in some cases, you know, it's not necessarily about not wanting to support these kind of initiatives, but not knowing, not knowing how to, you know, you're not having like kind of the right tools at hand, including legal, uh, legal tools. Of course, there's also situations where there is no, um, you know, uh, no public support or no even a, a very uh, strong way of opposition towards these um, community led initiatives. So that is, of course, also a case. But sometimes it's really about um, showcasing. Um, not just examples, but really legal tool, tools or financial tools. And it's it's proven quite effective to kind of make also national and local authorities talk to each other. Um, yeah, so that's maybe one of the thoughts that I could share about it. Thank you, Bea, very much for bringing those issues. So we arrive into the last couple of minutes of the event. We've got a couple of uh, questions that we didn't treat. Maybe are not going to be able to answer all. Uh, we apologize, but the discussion continues. You've got the context of the people, the panelists here. So we continue. We're going to close with a question. I think that was from Carmen from Brazil how to change the public policy for housing regarding the public policy to embrace sustainable projects in order to favor the environment and families. That links with the sustainability issue that was not commented. Maybe Alexandra could comment a little bit and tell about a couple of examples in different parts of the world. Thank you for, uh, for bringing me in here. Yeah, I just wanted to, to come back to this question on sustainability, but also the, to some extent that we've seen in many examples how community-led housing has also been approached as an as a interim solution, as a, as a means to maybe resolve uh, conflicts uh, in, in the short term or to deal with uh, uh, issues around mitigate, mit mitigation and uh, in a very localized way in terms of climate change. And I think in, in certain approaches, it has been sometimes even difficult to retain those experiences over time and to be able actually not to let it be absorbed by the, the ongoing uh, interest to then uh, transform that space uh, into, in, into, again, into a kind of more open market uh, and all the threats of individualizing ownership. We have been so many experiences that uh, sometimes more collective processes have been have become merely a stage, a stage, an instrument to which has then been become useful to then over time to bring, let's say, bring back that space or those properties to the to the open market again, and, and that has been a, a huge challenge, I think, for for community-led housing initiatives internationally to to 
try to re retain that situation of, of collectivization and therefore retain that social function of property and land uh, over time. And so I think that that's a massive threat. And I think the, the way to try to deal with some of those things, we've seen uh, some uh, emergence. I think uh, Joseph could talk also a bit later if there is the time around the establishment of a city learning platform in Freetown, which is the type of uh, city-wide alliances that uh, is, is, is able to then sustain uh, political momentum and social momentum behind uh, some, some, some of those ideas, continue, continued uh, pressure that is needed to then uh, retain those initiatives, to scale up, to institutionalize. I think that uh, links to some of the questions in the q and I think Mariangela raised some of those issues. What can be done to, to really try to unlock some of those power symmetries? And, uh, and really, it, that requires a, a, mind, a kind of mindset shift from community-led housing being a, nearly a kind of corporate social responsibility of the housing sector. You know, it cannot be just that uh, we do 90% of the business as usual and we do 2 or 3% of the business unusual. I mean, that, that is, is going to perpetuate that same structural challenge that I think Rodrigo was touching on earlier on. And it's fundamental here to, to really try to shift the tides in a more significant way. Wonderful. And I'm going to give the word to you because we are uh, have a little bit delayed. But please close our conversation. Tell us uh, about the next steps in this articulation of organizations that work with community-led housing so that we can know how will be the next stages and who is actually following is continue to follow us Brilliant. thank you uh, it's amazing to still have more than 100 people still with us here after this engagement shows that this, there's a lot of demand and interest to continue those conversations and that is amazing um, so we, i think this is part of an ongoing conversation and a series of engagements that uh, we, we hope to continue promoting in this area. I think uh, just to share a bit of my personal history, I joined now uh, the Human Settlements Group in September. And since, since then, I've been working with colleagues to convene and promote research, knowledge exchange, and policy kind of advisory and advocacy work around the agenda of, of housing justice. And we are strategizing this, this area of work, designing, implementing, those activities collaboratively with social movements, with our partners, partners here in this call, but others as well, such as Islam and Sheikh Dwellers International, Habitat International Coalition. I saw that Adrian Allen is here with us today in this event as well. Um, ACHR, the global platform for the rights of the city that Rodrigo has been also very active in that space, the Cohabitat Network. So we're trying to advance that agenda collaboratively uh, so that we can de design our common and share goals and to and and to and to promote this, um, we I think this this effort also try, talks to to ongoing efforts that we've been talking about, also previous work in IID that has been really important in this field. I think if you are interested, there has been recently two special issues on housing of environment and urbanization, which is a journal that is dedicated to, to publish the work of activists uh, and scholars uh, in the global south. So it's a, an incredible resource. So please have a look. In, in those documents. Also, um, David Satwhite has uh, submitted a, a really incredible submission to the United States and local government uh, gold report, uh, the gold five, where he, there was a report focusing on rethinking housing policies that I think is, a, is really a great contribution to this field. Another resource that I think is really useful that the group has, has done in the past. So I think our job now in the context of community-led housing, which is one of the agendas that we're trying to promote, we need uh, further work in this area. We need to go a bit deeper as the conversation was going in systematizing the, those actual institutional conditions that are enabling or disabling community-led housing. Uh, Bea was talking precisely about some of those factors, many interventions, and we need to, to really get uh, the evidence of the blockages and also the possibilities and tactics used to address them. And I think this is really the agenda that we, we are putting together on the table and we're trying to promote and we hope to, to carry out uh, further work in this field and involve all of you that have joined us today in this event uh, to continue joining and continue sharing experiences and, and hopefully acting together to try to promote and to make community-led uh, 
a housing uh, uh, a reality that is more meaningful and can bring uh, the type of cities that are more caring and more just uh, for, for all of us. So I think that's, that's really the overarching kind of agenda that we're trying to promote uh, from here. And I, I pass that back to, to you, Bianca. Thank you, Alexandre. So we are arriving to the final minutes of the event. I would like to thank who has been with us until now. We had a very good audience showing that the subject matter is very relevant. We've got people from different continents in this conversation. So once again, I want to highlight the invitation for all of you to hear being uh, be with us uh, within diplomatic.com.br. There are texts that are in English and Spanish. If you don't talk in, uh, don't understand Portuguese, thank our panelists that have been with us and uh, shared your experiences and exchange that knowledge. And uh, highlight the, this final that we are living these difficult moments, mainly here in Brazil and have an event like that that shows the possibilities to build pathways respect to the collective collectivity that uh, emphasis in, in collectiveness gives us a little hope and i hope that this message has arrived uh, touched you all thank you very much and we continue in touch and we hope that the network uh, continues to communicate and exchanging experiences. Thank you very much.